Right, we set to go. Yes? Because we've got roughly an hour and a half, and if you'd like lunch, then I better get started, huh? Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Thank you very much for coming again <laughs> on this rainy day. Uh, in the best traditions of uh, modern technology, uh, I couldn't get the pointer to work yesterday, so I decided to bring in a special pointer today, uh, chosen specially for this course. Uh, if you look carefully, you'll see Hercules. There you go, that's in honor of the, the course today. So this is gonna be my pointer today. I'll just wrap it up so we don't flap all over the place. And today what I'm going to do is talk less about uh, the theory of scattering and talk more about technical issues. So instrumentation, how do you produce neutrons to do experiments, uh, what sort of instruments and what sort of apparatus do you need on the instruments to be able to do experiments. Uh, and I'll try and finish up with uh, some ways to think about doing experiments. The way you would do scattering experiments for neutrons is a bit different to the way Perhaps the way you should think about doing scattering experiments for neutrons is a bit different to the way you might think about doing scattering experiments for other techniques, uh, largely because momentum and energy uh, transfer are coupled for neutrons to a much greater extent than they are for things like X-rays or electrons. Okay, so uh, here's the plan of what, I, what I'm going to be going through. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about neutron sources, talking about the production of something called free neutrons. Of course, they're not free in the financial sense, Neutrons are very expensive. But if you want to do uh, an experiment with neutron scattering, you need to be able to produce neutrons that are not attached to anything. They're, so they're free in the sense that they're to these single particles that are somehow flying through space, and then you can use them in your experiment. Uh, in order to be able to produce these neutrons, you need uh, something called a moderator to get them to the energies that you want. I'll talk a bit about guides. How do you get the neutrons from the source where you produce the neutrons to your instrument? And one of the ways that you can uh, transport them is using these things called guides. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, the ways that you do the experiment. Um, you, if you want to do a quantitative experiment, you generally need to know what the neutron wavelength or energy is. So there's essentially two ways of doing that with neutrons. You can use monochromators or time of flight, and I'll talk a bit about that. All right, now just to give you an idea about uh, sort of time scale, uh, and essentially how, if I can say this, how difficult it was to start doing neutron scattering, uh, I just wanted to go through a little bit about uh, a little bit of history about the timeline of uh, the development of, of, of neutron scattering. Uh, and when I put this up, I, I want to try and stress how uh, amazing the first part of the 20th century was as far as uh, science, the development of our understanding of science and particularly of physics was. It was it was quite a remarkable time, and it's very difficult, uh, without looking into a bit more detail, to appreciate just how rapidly our knowledge of, of, uh, uh, of the universe really developed in the first half of the 20th century, largely with the uh, development of, uh, largely due to Einstein, in fact, with the development of um, relativity, but also on the very small scale of our knowledge of quantum, quantum physics. Uh, and it was an astonishingly rapid development. Right, so here, for example, just to give you an idea of some of the timeline here, uh, here you've got in... Uh, 1905, when uh, Einstein proposes uh, the particle nature of light. Uh, and then Bragg uh, explains x-rays ray, were known about in the, uh, they were discovered in the, the very, very last part of the 19th century. Uh, so Bragg then uh, explains x-ray diffraction from crystals and then x-ray crystallography uh, sort of exploded, the, the field of x-ray crystallography exploded out of that uh, discovery. Then here in 1924, so about 19 years later, you've got De, Bro De Broglie, who uh, proposes the, uh, the, wave the wave nature of particles. And by this stage, people understood very well how X-ray diffraction worked. So as soon as he proposes this, within three years here, you've got the proof of, of this wave-like uh, uh, nature of particles with um, the measurement of electron diffraction. All right, so those were the first particles that they used to prove the wave-like uh, wave -like nature of, of these uh, quantum objects. Uh, and then here in 1932, people didn't know about neutrons in that stage. It was sort of proposed, but no one knew quite how the, uh, the structure of the nucleus looked. In 1932, Chadwick discovers the, uh, the neutron, and pretty quickly after, about four years later, all right, we already know that electron diffraction works. We already know that uh, uh, the, um, the particles can have these wave-like properties. So if you discover a new particle, instantly the theoreticians say, well, you should be able to do diffraction with that. Uh, and in 1936, 
uh, that's where the first diffraction was done. But that wasn't really a quantitative diffraction. And certainly, it wasn't this thing about X-ray crystallography, where you could use these wave-like particles, in this case light, to understand uh, the atomic structure of your material. And here in 1947, though, this was sort of the first quantitative measurement where you could start doing something like Newton crystallography. And if you look at the time scale here, right, this is uh, 11 years later. And I just wanted to, 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 to show this paper, uh, sorry, this book here, which is still an excellent book for, uh, for X-ray diffraction. It was a, quite a, a very nice summary of the theory of X-ray diffraction in crystals. That's published in 1944. Right, so this is one of the uh, sort of fundamental texts. People know a lot about X-ray diffraction. And it was only here, so many years after, that uh, the, the first sort of decent diffraction experiment could be done. And the question there, you know, given such rapid development, is why did it take so long to go essentially from, from here to here? You know, here's like 15 years from when you discover it to when you can do sort of the first serious diffraction measurement. And the major reason why it took so long can be summarized by uh, this sort of slide here. All right, so neutron scattering, what you're trying to measure is a count rate, number of neutrons per second. And now you have to worry about the accuracy of your measurement. It's a statistical process. You count a certain number of, of objects, and after a certain period of time, you can say with a certain precision or a certain uncertainty whether or not it's a real thing or whether it's just an artifact of something else. And that uncertainty according to the statistics of the way the measurement's carried out, is given by the square root of these number of counts. So to give you an idea, if you measure 10,000 of these counts, whatever they are, the uncertainty statistically is 100, or about 1%. Right? Now you might say, all right, I want a precision in my measurement of 1%. You've got to measure 10,000 of these things. All right? Neutron scattering is generally very weak. In fact, that's one of the key things with the first born approximation in order to get it to work is the uh, interaction between the neutrons and whatever you're scattering from must be weak. So that's known. So what you really need in order to count 10,000 counts, you might only get a very small percentage of those neutrons that actually scatter from your sample. You need a strong neutron source. And that was really what was lacking in the early days after they discovered the neutrons. Right, so this first measurement that I showed you yesterday as well, uh, this is the uh, one of the first measurements of uh, diffraction, neutron diffraction. And the way they set this up is they've got a source in here, uh, they've got two crystals, and they set them up at exactly the Bragg angles. They do a measurement with them exactly at the Bragg, angle, Bragg angles, and then they rotate the crystals a bit so they're no longer at the Bragg angles. You measure the number of neutrons at the Bragg, Bragg angles, you measure the number of neutrons not at the Bragg angles, you look at the difference, and you see if there's an increase. That's the way they did the experiment. And it worked. So this number here, if you look closer, you'll see NB minus NX. NB is at the Bragg angle. NX is when they're turned off. And if you look at the number of counts, five counts per minute. That's how they were counting. So you can imagine if you wanted 10,000 counts in that, you'd be there for a very long period of time indeed. Right? And that was the best. Right? They did a bunch of these experiments. That was the best statistics they've got. And if you look carefully, they've even put the error bars on this. This is 5 plus or minus 0.6. So it's, it's of the order of 10% error on, on what they got there. But it was good enough for them to say it worked. If you look at this second experiment here, this is the one where they measure the first, uh, the first Bragg peak. Uh, there, you've got 2,500 counts per minute. Okay? It's still fairly small. And one thing, if you look carefully at this picture, there's a sample in this, and it's a sample of uh, lithium fluoride. It's probably about as big as your fist. Uh, that's the size of the sample. So it's a huge sample. And they're still getting 2,500 counts a minute. It's not great, but it's good enough to do this sort of experiment there. Uh, and the major difference between these two is what they've used for the source. So if you consider the years here, you've got 1936 versus 1947. And what happened in the intervening period was the Second World War. But in addition to that, there were things uh, like uh, the Manhattan Project, and there was a huge advance in the way we were able to develop nuclear energy and the development of nuclear, react nuclear reactors. And the major difference between these two is that was done with a nuclear reactor and that was done with some sort of, uh, uh, it's an artificial radioactive source. Okay, so that is why it took so long, is the development of these very high flux facilities, essentially the development of nuclear reactors which allowed uh, these experiments to be done. So if you want to be able to produce these so-called free neutrons, um, there's essentially five ways that you can do it, plus or minus. All right, so uh, 
these are the five ways. Uh, the first one here, radioactive decay. Uh, and in fact, this was the way that people, um, people got neutrons in the first place. Uh, this is essentially an induced radioactive decay. What you do in this particular case is you have a, a radium beryllium source. Uh, the radium produces an alpha particle. The alpha particle hits the beryllium. You get an excited nucleus that then decays and it produces some carbon plus a neutron. And it, plus it dumps a lot of, uh, of energy, right? Mega electron volts of, of heat, effectively. It's not very efficient. So per radioactive decay, you get that quantity, 5 times 10 to the minus 4 neutrons per decay. So not very many, but it worked. And in fact, this is exactly the sort of uh, uh, source that Chadwick used. He used polonium instead of radium, but uh, exactly the sort of source that he used to discover the neutron in the first place. And then down here in this experiment, if you look, they've got a radium beryllium source in there. Uh, that's the way that they did the first uh, diffraction experiment to prove that neutron diffraction worked. These days, uh, we're able to produce isotopes of materials or, or uh, sort of higher than what you might find. Artificially create elements is what we're able to do. These are elements that are not found in nature and you're able to create that through nuclear technology. This one is called californium. Uh, and this seems to be uh, one of the highest producers of neutrons, naturally, if you like, produces neutrons. It's not a stable uh, element. It's not a stable isotope. It decays naturally, and it produces about 0.1 neutron per decay instead of 1 times 10 to the minus 3, right? So it's much more efficient. And in fact, you can use this, they use this for things like uh, humidity detectors, all right? So you can buy things like humidity detectors for, say, the soil, which will contain this. You stick it into the soil uh, and it produces neutrons. You detect the neutrons. You're able to work out what the humidity of your soil is. That's actually a commercially available material. But it's not really used for neutron scattering because it's still quite inefficient. You're not producing very many of it, very many neutrons, and it's quite difficult to get large quantities of, of this californium isotope. The second way, which is much more common, and, and up until uh, <coughs> probably about the, uh, the 80s or so, or, or the early 90s, this was the... Uh, uh, the majority of neutron sources use uh, this method, which is nuclear fission. Uh, for that, you need something like a nuclear reactor. A nuclear fission, uh, you take some uh, element, in fact, a particular isotope of an element. In this particular case, it's a, an isotope of uranium. Uh, if that uranium absorbs a neutron, and the neutron has to be slow, this is important, so it has a slow neutron that will come in, uh, there's a reasonably high probability then that the uranium will absorb that neutron it becomes unstable and then it will decay. It decays into two fission fragments. It spontaneously breaks apart. It produces, on average, about two and a half neutrons. And these neutrons are fast as well. They come out with high energy. It also produces a lot of heat. Okay, so the heat is very useful if you want to create electricity. You can convert that heat into uh, uh, electrical current by boiling water and then having some sort of turbine that relies on that. Uh, we're, of course, much more interested in these 2.5 fast neutrons. If we could, we would get these neutrons out into our instrument. We'd be able to do neutron scattering. The reactor production, what you generally find is you need one of these neutrons to continue the fission process. So the maximum number that you could ever create that you could get into your instrument would be of the order of 1.5. Uh, but in general, you get, you, you've got some losses and you'll get, on average, about one neutron per uh, fission process. And that was the method that was used by uh, this guy, Zinn. He had a nuclear reactor, he got his apparatus, and he, he, he put a hole through to look uh, towards uh, the reactor core. He got some neutrons come out. He stuck his sample on the end. He's got a detector. He's able to rotate the sample, and then he sees his lovely prick. Uh, he's able to then, if he wanted to, he could work out the integrated intensity in that, and that would tell him something about where the atoms were sitting inside your sample. Okay, so both of these types of sources are generally what we call continuous sources. Obviously, if you've got radioactive decay, you can't switch on and off radioactive decay. You've got something there, and it's going to spontaneously decay. So that continuously produces neutrons. Uh, the fission process is generally the same. There are some reactors that are called pulse reactors that are a bit more complicated. But generally, if you find a reactor that produces neutrons, it runs continuously. The ILL, for example, uh, you switch it on, it runs for about 50 days, and then you switch, it, it gets switched off. Right? By that point, essentially, the fuel is burned and you have to replace the fuel. Uh, so they generally run continuously, and they produce a continuous flux of neutrons with time. 
Right, this next one here, spallation, uh, I think it comes from a, I'm not sure if it's a Greek or a Latin work, it, it, a word. Uh, it, it, it means, it's associated with a word to mean to chip off. Uh, and that's effectively what happens. You have a high energy beam of uh, typically protons. Particles are coming with very high energy uh, of the order of a giga electron volt. And they come into a, a target that's quite heavy. Uh, tantalum, tungsten, uranium, mercury. You can change the target if you wish. It depends on the design of your source. This high energy proton interacts with, uh, with the atom inside, causes it to become excited, and a little part of that will, will sort of chip off, and it produces quite a lot of neutrons in the process as well. A lot of neutrons will just fly out of that particular process. You get a lot of neutrons. You get of the order of 60 per proton if you set it up correctly. So you also generate a bit of heat and things like that, quite a lot of heat, because you're hitting it with giga electron volts. Uh, you're producing some energy as well in the process. So you do have to worry about things like heat loads, but it's a potentially a, a quite an efficient process to be able to get a lot of neutrons out per particle that comes in. And there's a number of these sources around the world. In fact, uh, there's a brand new one being built in southern Sweden, uh, which is the sort of the next generation highest flux source uh, called the uh, ESS, the European Spallation Source. This is one that already exists. Uh, it's in the UK. It's called ISIS. Uh, and what happens is they've got this particle accelerator here uh, here they're, they're generating up to, uh, it's a, it says 100 mega volt, 800 megavolt proton synchrotron. So they, they, they spin these protons up to, to very high energies. And then they've got two what they call target stations. They shoot pulses out to these target stations. These proton packets arrive at the target. They hit the target. They produce lots of neutrons. And then all these instruments are sort of around the source. The source is where these sort of, uh, well, they, they're called target stations. And that's the actual source of the neutrons there. Now these things, they produce neutrons as long as the protons hit the target. And you do, as I mentioned earlier, you do have a problem with uh, heat load on these things. So if you want the highest potential flux of neutrons, what you generally do is pulse the source. So you, you hit it with a packet of protons. You produce a lot of neutrons in a pulse. You also produce a lot of heat. But then you can dissipate the heat in a time it takes for the next pulse to come along. So that's one way you can be clever with uh, creating the neutrons. And um, you can also exploit that later in instrumentation, which I'll come to. Some spallation sources are continuous. There's one in Switzerland, for example, that operates exactly like this. But the majority of them are pulsed. And something I wanted to mention, um, if you know a little bit about neutrons and neutron politics, uh, it's a bit of a delicate thing, right? It's, you're essentially having to work with radioactive materials. Reactors these days, if you wanted to build a new reactor, there's various political and environmental issues. Uh, it's not particularly popular. Um, spallation sources seem to be easier to make, but they're also very expensive. Uh, something that seems to be coming along uh, is something called stripping. And this is important because uh, a lot of the reactors that were built to do neutron scattering, were, they were built in like the, the 50s, 60s, uh, and they're, they're essentially being closed down. And in fact, we've had two lost in the last year. There was one in Berlin and there's one in Paris. And they were both relatively old, and they were both shut down in the last year. So there's fewer and fewer neutron sources in Europe. This is a major concern if you're interested in doing neutron scattering. You know, will there be neutrons available in 10 years' time? You're all young. Your, your careers are in front of you. You're going to be working for, don't start crying, but you're probably going to be working <laughs> for the next 40 years or so. You know? <laughs> uh, that's how long you've got to go. So if you're going to do neutron scattering, and I hope you do, then uh, you're going to want neutron sources. So this idea of stripping here is uh, uh, something that people are, are trying to explore uh, to be able to build what we call medium flux neutron sources. They're not the highest flux, but you don't need the highest flux for an awful lot of experiments. You do need neutrons. So the idea here, it's comp one idea is compact accelerator driven neutron source or, or CANS. Here's a couple of uh, very nice reviews if you're interested in looking on that. And the idea here is instead of, it's sort of somewhere between radioactive decay and spallation. Instead of coming in with high energy particles uh, and then chipping off a bit of a heavy uh, uh, nucleus, you come in with low energy uh, particles and then you get these sort of uh, nuclear reactions here where a low energy proton, for example, or a low energy deuterium gets absorbed by the nucleus, it becomes unstable, it then decays, a little bit like radioactive decay, and you produce neutrons out of that. Uh, these are sort of three processes that uh, are being looked at. Uh, the idea of these uh, compact accelerators is that you don't use, a, they're not that expensive to build, they, uh, you need low energies so you don't need a huge amount of power to run them. Uh, you can build them relatively cheaply, 
uh, and you can provide a lot of them. So this is a plan that uh, is being explored around the world, particularly in Europe by uh, the Germans and the French. Uh, and uh, hopefully, these sorts of things will become available in the next 10, 15 years or so. Um, it's relatively low uh, um, efficiency, similar sort of thing to what we were seeing with the radioactive decay at the top here. Uh, but if you design the thing very, very carefully, you've got a lot more control out of, over how you create these, uh, these neutrons instead of this uh, radioactive decay process up here. Uh, so you can be clever with the way that you produce neutrons. Here's an example of one. This is uh, one that's operating in Japan. Uh, there's a bunch of these all around the world, including some in Europe. Uh, if you look in uh, Ian Anderson's paper here from 2016, he's got a very nice summary, not only of the ones that are currently existing, but the ones that are potentially coming online. Uh, so if I, I know, for example, just to give an example, there's a, uh, an effort in Bilbao in, in Spain to build this sort of, uh, this sort of uh, source. Now the third one, and now we're sort of into the realm of science fiction, uh, and this is where, uh, sorry, third, fifth one, <laughs> I can't count, uh, the, um, the idea of fusion. Uh, fusion, of course, has been, I think the joke is uh, people claim that fusion uh, We'll have fusion to generate electricity in 10 years, and they've been saying that for the last 30 years. Uh, but um, now <laughs> there's a possibility, at least in theory, that you could use fusion to create neutrons. Um, and um, it's not yet used, and it, it pr quite probably never will. There's a lot of technical issues to do with this, but I'll tell you about it, uh, to, just to give you a bit of context. So the idea of fusion is you take two very light nuclei. In this case, it's a deuterium and a tritium atom, and you bring them together, uh, you need enough energy to be able to bring them together and to get them to fuse to form a helium atom and you'll produce neutrons plus a lot of energy. Okay, so the process is similar to fission. You'll get approximately, well you'll get exactly one neutron per fission, but the difference with fission is that uh, you don't need that neutron to then create another fission process. That neutron somehow, depending on the efficiency of how you build your source, you could potentially use that particular neutron to go into your instrument. So it's about efficient, as efficient as, as fission uh, for neutron scattering. Uh, and here's a paper, it's a little bit dated now, but here was a paper where they proposed a method that you could do it. Uh, you would have these little frozen beads of deuterium and tritium, and you drop them, and then you synchronize a pulse of, uh, of laser light, uh, a very clever pulse of laser light that causes this, uh, this pellet to be compressed to extremely high pressures where you induce fission inside this pellet uh, and then you'll spontaneously get all these neutrons flying off uh, and then you, whoops, sorry, you, you've, got, um, you've got sort of lead here to guard against radiation and various other sorts of things and then eventually you can get that thing into your, uh, get some neutrons into your sample. Uh, the challenge with this is you produce a huge amount of radiation when you do this and you make everything around it radioactive uh, one of the problems is that all the stuff around it would become so radioactive that after one of these pellets, you'd have to throw it all away and get another one. Uh, so this is one of the sort of things that you'd have to, to look into. Potentially very expensive, uh, but you could produce a lot of neutrons. And just to give you an idea, this is a, this is a variation on a well-known curve. Uh, and I usually introduce this by saying, um, all people who work in neutron sources are liars, and you should never believe them, except for me. Uh, now, people... <laughs> People like to plot here, this is the year, and this is what's called the effective neutron flux. Uh, and you'll, you'll, you'll often get them as well, it'll go right down to 1932, where you had one neutron from Chadwick. Of course, now you've got orders of magnitude coming up here. And the big question with all of this is, what is the effective flux? What does that actually mean? Uh, now, if you work in some sources, you'll say something. If you work in other sources, you'll say something else. And how you define this, that's always an issue. But it's a good slide to show to give you an idea of how, uh, how neutron sources, how, how many neutrons you can get from neutron sources. So with reactor sources, fission reactor sources, and here you've got ILL, you're getting of the order of 10 to the 15 neutrons effective flux. That's uh, considered by everybody to be a fair number. Then you've got these spallation sources here, uh, this is a little bit dated, so it has the spallation source in the US, which is called SNS. ESS is somewhere up around here somewhere. It's uh, somewhere between 10 to the 16 and 10 to the 18, depending on who you ask. Uh, but it, it, it's generally agreed that this is more or less saturating. It's going to maybe incrementally go up a little bit, but it's not going to leap orders of magnitude. And the idea of this fusion thing is that you could go up orders of magnitude. That is one way that you could get a lot higher flux, if you could get it to work 
if you could be bothered to spend the money and to negotiate with the politics. Right, now if I summarize all of this, uh, then I've tried to give numbers here to give you sort of the idea of the effective flux as a function of the different uh, types of source. So with radioactive decay, you know, you might say that um, 10 to the 9 is high. Actually, it's not. When you consider the number of neutrons that you can get out into your instrument, there'll be losses there. The number of neutrons that will actually scatter from your instrument, there'll be losses there. Then you're well down on, on, uh, on flux by the time you get into your detector. So these really aren't any good for doing neutron scattering. Reactor production obviously is good, and the sort of intensity you get out of that, this is time integrated. So over time, you'll get of the order of 10 to the 15 neutrons per centimeter squared per second. That's about what's produced by ILL, and obviously that's good enough to do neutron scattering. You know, you've got six orders, six orders of magnitude between those. This isn't time integrated either. That depends on the number of decays. Spallation sources, depending on who you talk to, uh, certainly because they tend to be pulsed, you'll get a spike in the neutron production, and then you'll get nothing. And then you get another spike, and then you get nothing. So there are two numbers that's important. One is what's the instantaneous flux, and here you'll certainly get a lot more neutrons in your instantaneous pulse than you will out of the, uh, uh, out of the reactor. On the other hand, if you integrate over time, you get correspondingly a lot less, because for a lot of, for a lot of that time, your source is off. So depending, again, on who you talk to, you're getting of the order of 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 neutrons uh, per centimeter squared per second, which is comparable to a reactor. The ESS is supposed to have of the order of the same neutrons per se uh, integrated neutrons per second as the ILL, plus or minus, you know, a factor two, something like that. Compact accelerator, of course, is going to be a lot lower, right? The compact accelerator will produce a lot less neutrons, but it's not designed to outcompete these two productions in terms of neutron production. It's designed to outcompete them in terms of how much it costs and how easy it is to run and how many you can have. Very important for people like you, if you want to do neutron scattering, you want access to neutrons. All right? And if you've only got one or two places where you can do it and it's very competitive to get in, you're going to give up and do something else. And we don't want that. What we want is more sources for you people to be able to explore what you can do and learn. So that's why these compact accelerator, this idea is, uh, is very important. Fusion source, now you're seeing a big jump, right? So now you've got four, maybe more orders of magnitude over uh, what you can get with uh, reactors and or spallation sources, if you could do it. However, you know, you've got to put the whole thing into context. So this is kind of a nice number to show. If you took a candle, right, and you work out the number of photons produced by a candle, it's quite an easy calculation, all right, because uh, it's even defined essentially <laughs> as a candela, <laughs> uh, which is an SI unit. Uh, and you work out how many photons per second per steroiding you're getting out of that. It's about the same as you get out of the ILL. Right? So the number of neutrons produced by the ILL is about the same as the number of photons produced by a candle. Right? You compare that to a synchrotron. Right? 10 to the 25 for the ESRF, and probably more now because they've just upgraded the source. XFEL, 10 to the 30, greater than 10 to the 30, and bear in mind as well, this is per millimeter squared. So you've got, this is per centimeter squared, and this is per millimeter squared. So you've got another factor of 100 that goes into that. It's just the number of neutrons that we have to work with is very small compared to that. Yeah, oh, yeah, one here. Um, if you have a spallation source, can you use the pulse measure, the time of flight measurement, and then you would basically have an effective flux of 10 to the power of 16 or 17? That's what I'm going to come to in the next part of the talk, yes. And the answer is yes. There was a question there. Uh, so, how much, uh, what percentage of this uh, 10 to the power 15 corresponds to, like, theoretically, how much we get and how much we have as it, uh, how do you say, like, this 10 to the power 15 element? Yeah, okay. So, perhaps the best way I can describe that is by saying something like, um, if you start, you start with this, that's what your source is producing. By the time you get into your detector, if you've got of the order of 10,000 counts a second, you have a very intense peak. So that's 10 to the 4, right? So you're going from 10 to the 15 to 10 to the 4 by the time you get into your detector. And that's strong. And often, you'll be down to a few counts per minute if you're looking at inelastic scattering. So you're potentially losing 15 orders of magnitude <laughs> from going from your source to when you eventually count a good neutron in your detector. No, 10 to the 15 is what your source produces. 
your reactor produces of the order all the neutrons produced by the reactor, you're getting about 10 to the 15 neutrons per centimeter squared per second. By the time you get to your sample, you might have of the order of 10 to the 6 of that order. Maybe 10 to the 8. 10 to the 6, 10 to the 8. It depends. Uh, so you've already lost a lot on top of this. By the time you get into your detector, because you have to worry about how efficiently your sample scatters, you might have one or two per minute if you're looking at a weak signal. So that gives you an idea of how many losses you've got going from your source into your detector. You, you start with something and you're just losing the whole way across. It's, it's unavoidable. I mean, your sample interacts weakly with, uh, with, with the neutron radiation. So that's, that's why you need really powerful sources, because a lot of this stuff is just very improbable. You're going to see it. OK, now I mentioned earlier, that, that's, that's the sources. And just to give you an idea of what we're fighting against with neutron scattering, you know, we, we, we say we want free neutrons. We quite honestly can't produce that many of them. Right? We would like to have a lot more. These sorts of things, these sorts of numbers here would be amazing. But uh, it's, just, it's just too difficult to do that. Now, once you produce the neutrons, you've got to somehow get them to an energy that's usable. All right? So the neutrons that come out are of, are of these sorts of processes, fission or spallation. Uh, they tend to be of the order of, it's not quite true for the stripping one. They're a bit lower energy. But for fission and spallation, they're of the order of mega electron volts. Okay? As I tried to tell you yesterday, neutron scattering needs new, uh, these neutrons of energy milli electron volts. So this gives you a sort of a spectrum that would come out from a, a fission process in a reactor. You can see the energy scale here is in mega electron volts. You get a big peak here at about uh, one mega electron volt. You've got to somehow cool those down or get them colder by nine orders of magnitude to energies that you can actually use. And for that, you need a material called a moderator. All right, so moderators, the, the high energy neutron comes in. And the idea is it rattles around inside some sort of material. It scatters inside this uh, thing called a moderator. And when it eventually, it loses energy in every process. And when it eventually comes out, it has milli electron volts. All right, so what do you use for this moderator? Well, there's a bunch of uh, conditions that it should really satisfy. Uh, it's got to have a high probability for interaction. Right? If it's got a low probability for interaction, then it's not going to work at all. Uh, you should be able to dump the energy. You're going to be heating it up. Right? You don't want it to burn or you don't want it to melt or anything like that. Uh, it should be something that you can then extract the heat out of relatively efficiently. You don't want it to get too radioactive. Radioactivity generally means that your material, whatever it is, when, when you're talking about neutron scattering, it's absorbed a neutron and then the isotope or the, the uh, nucleus that's absorbed the neutron becomes unstable and then it will decay. Right? If it absorbs the neutron, you don't have the neutron to do scattering afterwards. So you don't want it to get too radioactive. You also have to treat it afterwards, yeah? So if you've got a material that's highly radioactive, it's dangerous to work with. You don't want stuff like that. You want it to be relatively easy to handle. It shouldn't be toxic or poisonous. It shouldn't react with things like uh, air or, or, uh, or the, the, the container that it's, that it's in or anything like that. And ideally, it should be cheap. All right? You don't want to have to spend a fortune on, I don't know, liquid platinum or something crazy like that. <laughs> Hydrogen makes an excellent moderator. And that's great, right? Because water is cheap, all right? Water is fantastic. Things like methane, hydrogen, very, very good moderators. They're generally liquids, so you can circulate the liquid. You can extract the, uh, the, the heat very easily. Don't get very radioactive. They're very easy to handle. Uh, they, don't, they don't really get radioactive themselves. They do get a little bit, of course. You still do need to worry about that. Uh, but generally, you'll find that all neutron sources have hydrogen-based moderators around them. Okay, so even this first experiment here, if you look carefully, you'll see this paraffin howitzer. Uh, again, I think that's a fantastic name for it. But that whole thing, paraffin, is a wax. And what they've had to do is put their, uh, their neutron source inside this large wax container. The neutrons fly out with high energy. They rattle around inside this paraffin, and then eventually some of them will come out in the directions that you want them. If you're using reactors, then a reactor needs a moderator just to sustain the reaction. All right? So the neutron needs to be slow to cause efficient process, but it produces fast neutrons. And one of those neutrons you have to then slow down in order to get it to be able to pr produce the next fission process. So all reactors are naturally moderated. Uh, and here's a cut through from the ILL. In the center here, this part here, that's your fuel element. That's where your uranium actually is. And it sits inside this container here. The container is full of uh, uh, 
uh, deuterated water. And the neutrons that come out very high energy, they rattle around in this deuterated water, they lose energy. They then are able to then interact again with the uranium to produce the next fission process. And some of them will, uh, will, will come out and you'll be able to put them in your, in your instrument. So if you take a reactor, that what we call a thermal reactor, like the ILL, uh, then um, you'll get, you, you can plot sort of the neutron energy here versus the neutron intensity in a moderated reactor. So what you find is that there's sort of this peak here in the mega electron volt regime. And that peak comes about, those are the neutrons that are initially released in the fission process. And then depending on how efficient the moderator is, you see this sort of great big long tail and then this peak here in what's called the thermal flux. Right? It's called thermal because at the ILL, the temperature of the, uh, of the liquid moderator, of the, the deuterated water, the heavy water moderator, is kept at about room temperature. It's about 300 Kelvin. If you look at the uh, intensity or the, the flux coming off uh, that part of the moderator as a function of energy here, you get this very classic type of curve. It's called a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. It's the same sort of curve you would see from what we call a black body radiator. So if you heat it up, just a piece of metal, and you looked at the, the heat distribution of the, 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 the heat energy coming off, it would have the same type of distribution as this. And the maximum here, that's at the energy uh, of, that's the temperature. That's equivalent to the temperature of what you keep it at. So in a thermal reactor, like the ILL, then the peak in this is at 300 Kelvin, which is room temperature. That's the temperature that we keep the moderator at. All right, there you go. So it's about 25 milli electron volts, which is about what we need for neutron scattering, 300 Kelvin. Now I showed you this curve yesterday, and this shows you the whole range of, of sorts of science that you can do with neutrons. But you can't just use 300 Kelvin neutrons to do it. Uh, you need a whole range of different energies to be able to access all of these length scales and all of these time scales. In fact, you can get an idea of the sorts of energy that you would need for the neutron to most efficiently do your experiment uh, if you just use Bragg's law. So here's a table showing Bragg's law. You've got the different types of science here with the different types of despacings that you could access. So polymers, you're looking at something of the order of a... <coughs> uh, that's, uh, what's that? That's um, a micron, I think. Yes. So that's at the order of a micron, 10,000 angstroms. Um, right down here to glasses, where you really want to know despacings or, or liquids, the despacings of the order of an angstrom here. Uh, you can then look at the momentum transfer that you need to access. Uh, you can look at the Bragg angles that you'd need to access to be able to measure those things. Uh, and here in the polymers regime, these angles get pretty small. And the energies that, you, that that equates to for the neutrons vary here over an extremely large range. And if you're only limited to neutrons that were about here, about 25 milli electron volt, uh, and you look back at this table here, then you might be right down here for polymers where there's no flux, or you might be right out here for glasses where again there's no flux. So it becomes a very inefficient way to do these types, to measure these types of, uh, of samples if you stayed only with 300 Kelvin neutrons. So in order to get around that, we've got things that are called inserts. They'll sit inside the reactor, and they're designed to shift this flux to higher or lower temperature. And they are literally different temperatures. So one of them is called a cold source, right? Cold source, we've got two at the ILL. The cold source at the ILL is this uh, liquid deuterium. Uh, it's held at about 25 Kelvin. And the neutrons that come into that rattle around inside this liquid deuterium and they get cooled down. They lose energy. So what you get then is your Maxwell distribution gets shifted to uh, much smaller energies. And if you wanted to measure these very long length scales, you would attach your instrument to, or you point your instrument to this cold source, and then you get a lot more neutrons in the energies that are useful. Uh, there's another alternative, which is um, the hot source. All right? And I'm not talking about something with chili or anything like that. This one here has... Um, uh, one, again, we've got one at the ILL. This is a, a ball of graphite, right? So you're producing a lot of gamma radiation inside the reactor as well. The gammas go into the graphite and they heat it up. And the temperature is of the order of uh, 2,000 Kelvin. The neutrons that go into that, they rattle around. They gain energy from the, the graphite. They get sped up and they'll come out. And again, uh, much higher energy. And then you're shifting your uh, Maxwell distribution to the other side. If you want to look at things like liquids or glasses, you would point your instrument at this source 
and then you get a lot more neutrons in the energies that you wanted. So if you look now to, uh, a sort of again, a slice through of the ILL, of course, uh, a lot of reactors have similar sorts of setup, but I'm showing the ILL because we're best. Um, if you look here at ILL, you've got a fuel element in the middle, very centralized, and then you've got all these sort of beam tubes around. Uh, if you could plot sort of the distribution of neutrons as a function of the radius, there's a spatial aspect to this a, a, as well. This whole lot is sitting inside um, uh, your, your uh, heavy water moderator. And it turns out you get a maximum in the flux of your 300 Kelvin neutrons at a certain radius. Uh, and what you can see here is all these beam tubes, this is where the neutrons come out. They're all pointing more or less tangential. All these yellow ones are pointing more or less tangential to that, uh, to that radius there, to a circle of that radius. So the idea is that the neutrons have got your maximum in, in that flux there. You, you literally drill a hole in the side of the reactor and hope that some come out. That's the way that it works. Uh, and you're going to get the maximum number of neutrons coming out along this direction if you're pointing at where the maximum of the flux is. There's another reason why you make them tangential. You get a whole lot of garbage that comes off the, uh, the fuel element when it undergoes fission. You'll get not just the neutrons you want, but you'll get gammas, you'll get all sorts of other particles, all sorts of rubbish. You point it tangentially and you get less of those extra rubbish particles coming out along your beam tube. So they all tend to be sort of tangential to this particular radius here. And then there are a, a bunch of inserts. You have these two cold sources, one there and one there, and then you've got some beam tubes that point at those cold sources. They're seeing the colder neutrons come out. And you've got one hot source here. Again, you've got a bunch of these beam tubes pointing to the hot source. And that's the way that you would shift around the, uh, the distribution of neutrons to be able to most efficiently do your experiment with the maximum number of good neutrons. This is a reactor, but you see exactly the same thing in other types of sources. So here is a, a cutaway of one of the target stations at ISIS. This is where the proton beam comes. You've got a target in here. Proton beam hits the target, produces a lot of neutrons. Neutrons have high energy. Uh, so they've got a bunch of these different types of moderators around. You don't need to moderate the neutrons to create another fission process, but you do need to moderate them to be able to use them in your experiment. So here above the source, you've got ambient temperature water. So this is like a thermal moderator for a spallation source. And underneath, you've got a couple here. There's a hydrogen moderator at 20 Kelvin. And there's another one here, methane at 100 Kelvin. So these are designed to slow the neutrons down to energies and then, uh, that are usable for the instruments. And then you put the, in the instrument that wants those energies pointed to those moderators. And that's an efficient way of being able to use that. Uh, this is the SNS. I, I haven't shown, I should, maybe next year, I'll update this to show the ESS, which is uh, even newer. Uh, but you'll see that uh, similar sort of process. On, on this one, you've got moderators attached around the various things. Here at the ILL, uh, again, you've got all the inserts. Uh, but then once you've produced the neutrons, how do you get them to the instrument? Okay, so if you, um, if you, as I mentioned earlier, you get the maximum number of neutrons in here, but you've got no way uh, of being able to direct them towards your sample, right? Neutrons have no charge, so you can't apply things like uh, electrostatic fields or anything like that to be able to make them move or to manipulate them. Uh, you can't accelerate them, you can't focus them, not easily, not with those sorts of techniques. Similar sorts of things that you could do, for example, with uh, electrons. Uh, and their optic properties are a bit different to uh, things like um, uh, X-rays, where you can preferentially produce X-rays that will point in a certain direction. Um, so how do you do it? Uh, well, if you want to put an instrument right up close to the reactor, you do literally drill a hole in the reactor and hope that some of the neutrons come out, and then some of those will eventually hit your sample, and then you're able to do your experiment. But then you run out of room very quickly around this. Uh, you, you just don't physically have enough space to put a lot of instruments around that. And furthermore, um, it's not very uh, efficient. You, you can put a whole lot of holes in the side here. Uh, if you put the instrument further away, you've got sort of a solid angle problem. As you get further away, you're going to get less and less neutrons that eventually get to the position where you want them. So for that, we use something called uh, neutron guides. Right, now, a guide operates on the principle of neutron reflectivity. All right, so reflectivity, the idea is that you have some sort of incident wave come in, and then you have some surface, and you have a difference in the refractive index of what you're coming from and where you're going to. And when this wave, it's not just for neutrons, of course, it's for any wave. When this neutron wave hits the interface, you get some of the wave that gets reflected, 
and the angle that it comes out with is the same that angle comes in with. And some of the neutrons get refracted and they get transmitted into the medium. All right, and the, how this works out depends on the uh, refractive index of the two materials. Okay, if you look at these angles, angle of, ang angle of incidence and angle of reflection, of course, are the same, but then you've got an angle inside the material here. This is the refracted wave. And they're related through this, uh, this law called Snell's law. So you've got these two angles and you've got the two refractive indices. If you try and plot that for neutrons, uh, this is also true for x-rays, by the way, uh, you, can, you can get the, uh, the, the reflectivity, uh, which is given by this quantity here. It's a, the uh, reflected intensity divided by the incident intensity. If you plot that for, for neutrons, and here's an example going from air to silicon, um, you'll get something like this. And what's very important about this is this works if you go from a, uh, a low refractive index, sorry, wrong way around, a high refractive index to a low refractive index. Right, so I'll just return to this. And this is important here because um, the refractive index for neutrons and for x-rays is defined by this sort of quantity here. And you'll notice that there's one minus some number. So if you take the refractive index for a vacuum or for air, the refractive index is, is one. And then you're going into a lower refractive index for neutrons and for x-rays. So if you, if you keep that in mind, you're going from a high refractive index to a low refractive index, and you plot as a function of momentum transfer here, you get a reflectivity curve here. That's what it looks like. And if you look very carefully, right down the bottom here, you've got some sort of critical cue. You focus in on that, and all of the beam gets reflected. This is called total external reflection. Uh, it's exactly the same principle as an optic fiber works, except there's a slight difference in that, um, which I'll come to in a minute, to do with the refractive indices. But this gives you sort of an example of how uh, total, they call it internal reflection here, works for light. You've got light that can bounce around inside the fiber. Same sort of thing for a neutron. This is what we call a neutron guide. It's made out of glass, and then it's often coated with some sort of metal coating to uh, make the refractive index more negative. Uh, and then it's evacuated. So the neutrons are going through a vacuum, and then they hit the walls of this guide, and they'll get totally externally reflected. Uh, and then you can put your instrument, you have your source here, you put your instrument up there, and you can put your instrument a lot further away from the source and transport quite efficiently. All right, now, something to, uh, to keep in mind, though, with this is the, um, the difference between visible light, if you're talking things like refractive indices, and x-rays or neutrons. Right, so just to give you an idea, here is uh, Snell's law again. And if you look at where this critical angle must be for a given wavelength, where this criti crit critical angle must be to get total reflection, uh, you get this quantity here. And what you realize pretty quickly is that, um, well, you, you have to worry about what the ratio of the two refractive index indices are. And for visible light, there's a massive difference between uh, the refractive index for air and the refractive index for something like glass. I mean, it's so big that if you get a, a glass with water and you put a straw in it and you look at it from the side, you can see the refraction, the, 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 the straw looks cut in half, right? That's the refraction effect due to the difference in the uh, uh, refractive index of air versus, versus water in that case. And then this angle becomes very big. So you can get an optic fiber and you can bend it quite a lot and you'll still get a very good transport of the light inside the optic fiber. Very useful. For neutrons though, not so much, all right? So, the, 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 uh, the element with the highest refractive index, sorry, I should say the other way around, the element with the smallest refractive index is uh, nickel, right? This is the quantity here for the uh, refractive index. So it's one minus, and this, by the way, this is this uh, coherent scattering length I was telling you about yesterday. So it's one minus this coherent scattering length. And that coherent scattering length is, is one of the biggest for nickel. It's about this quantity here. If you multiply these up, you realize that the critical angle is about 0.1 degree multiplied by the wavelength you're interested in. Right? So I showed you yesterday that thermal neutrons are about a wavelength of 1.5 angstroms. Okay? So that is uh, very small. 1.5 angstroms is 0.15 degrees. So you can't bend very much your guide. But it does allow you to transport these uh, rather small divergence neutrons a very, very long way indeed. And then people are exploiting that. Uh, they're able to make these things over very long distances. Uh, it's exploited a lot at the ILL. So we've got two what are called guide halls. You've got the source here with a bunch of instruments around it. And then you've got these two guide halls with these guides transporting the neutrons a very long way away. 
and you're able to put the instruments at the end of those, uh, you're able to get a lot more instruments around the source in that case. Uh, you're also able to exploit some of the other properties of, of the, the, the distance in other, in other aspects. And people are able to do optics with this as well to try and boost the performance of the instrument. So uh, this is a, a relatively new proposition here by Jochen Stahn called the Selene concept. And he's sort of doing point-to-point -point focusing using a parabolic mirror, in this case for neutrons. And it works. It works quite nicely under certain conditions. You have to be very careful. Here you've got very small angles, if you look at them. They're really glancing angles, less than a degree. Uh, and then um, you're going from a point to a point, both vertically here and also around the side, and you're really able to get nice focusing. If you've got a, a well-defined source, you're able to bring all those neutrons that you want to the sample. So it can be quite efficient. Now, one thing I will say, though, is that these things, at the ILL, I think the longest guides are of the order of uh, 100 meters, uh, maybe a bit less. People really exploit the length of these guides at spallation sources, and I'll come to that in just a minute. Um, but some of the guides of the ESS will be 160 meters long, and there's even talk about some of them in the future potentially being 300 meters long. So it's a way that you can transport neutrons over very long distances very efficiently with very, very small losses, and you can really exploit... Well, if you make your instrument a long way away as well from the source, things like background is, is a lot smaller as well. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of advantages to do with that. Now, I'm supposed to uh, make a short pause. It's now 10 to 12. If we have a short pause, how hungry are you guys? Uh, let, let's have a pause for like five minutes and then um, come back. I felt a bit bad about you guys getting to the canteen yesterday. Uh, so let's make a short pause and be back here in less than 10 minutes. Okay, so I've told you a little bit now about uh, guides. Uh, so this is how you would get neutrons from the source to your instrument. All right? And then you have to worry about, uh, obviously, what you put at the end of that guide, how you're going to build your instrument. Uh, and one of the things that you need to do uh, for a quantitative experiment is to know what the wavelength of your radiation is. Okay? This is not easy for neutrons because there are no, energy, there are no useful energy-sensitive detectors for neutrons. Right? Uh, uh, unlike other techniques, like for x-rays or for electrons, uh, you'll get some sort of ionization effect. The energy of whatever you produce is proportional to the energy of the particle that came in. Uh, that's not true for neutrons. Right? So the way you detect neutrons effectively is to have some sort of secondary process. The first thing that's got to happen is that the neutron gets absorbed by some, uh, some uh, nucleus somewhere, and then ideally the, uh, the nucleus decays very quickly and promptly and it gives off a charged particle and you detect that charged particle. But there's no effective correlation between the energy of the neutron that came in and the energy of the charged particle that gets emitted. So here's some, uh, here's some uh, uh, classic ones that we use. Helium-3 is used a lot. All right? Helium-3, it's a gas. It's an isotope of helium. It has a very high absorption uh, uh, cross-section, very high probability for absorbing neutrons. When it absorbs one very quickly, it decays into this tritium atom. It produces a proton. You detect that. Uh, we use it a lot. It's, um, uh, it's very nice, the fact that you can make it as a gas, uh, and then you can change things like the pressure of your gas and things like this. You can design the shape of the container to be optimized for your instrument. Uh, that's extremely good. There's some uh, political issues with it, though. Uh, helium-3 doesn't really occur naturally. The only way that we can get hold of it, interestingly, is through the nuclear weapons program. Uh, people use tritium to make hydrogen bombs. Uh, right? The tritium decays eventually to produce helium-3. So helium-3 is a byproduct of the, uh, the nuclear weapons industry. Uh, but that, uh, we, we use it a lot. Uh, boron, uh, boron is, is quite nice. It's uh, uh, relatively cheap. There's quite a lot of boron-10 in nature. So if you isotopically enrich, then you're able to get that out. You can make this as, uh, as solids. You can deposit it as thin films and things like that. That produces a lithium and uh, a, uh, an alpha particle here. Uh, so that's another one. Gadolinium is also quite a nice one. It has a massive absorption cross-section uh, and produces an electron when it comes off, a gamma and an electron. So you're able to detect that. But that's effectively the way that you uh, would detect the neutrons. Uh, what I want to say with this, though, is that what you get out at the end is not proportional to the energy of the neutron that came in. Yeah? 
Yeah, it was a similar sort of process. I'd, I'd have to go back and show you on the earlier slide. But what happened is the neutron came out, it interacted with the target, and I can't remember what the target was off the top of my head. Yeah, there was a recoil. There was a recoil and there were charged particles that came out afterwards and they had an ionization chamber directly behind it and you could see, you could see uh, where they came from. And then based on, uh, based on that, they could work out the mass of the particle that came in. Uh, and the mass of the particle is what told them that it was a neutron. Uh, okay, so um, if you want to know the wavelength for your neutrons, then uh, there's effectively two ways that you can do it. The first one is, uh, is pretty well known from a bunch of other types of techniques. Uh, you can use a uh, crystal monochromator. All right? uh, you get a, a very well-defined, very nice crystal with very well-defined despacing between certain planes, and you use Bragg's law. All right? You have a beam of neutrons coming in, you get your crystal at a certain orientation, you'll get one wavelength coming out. In fact, you get multiple wavelengths, so you have to be a bit careful. Sometimes you need to filter against these multiple wavelengths. And the second one here is time of flight, right? So neutrons, uh, their speed is inversely proportional to their wavelength. And they're not moving that fast. The, the neutrons we're interested in are of the order of a kilometer a second. Right? That's actually not that fast. And you can, you can differentiate, if you measure the time it takes for a neutron to travel a certain distance, uh, you can then work out what its, uh, what its wavelength is based on its speed. Uh, and there are essentially three types of ways you can do it. You can uh, use choppers. What, we call them choppers. They literally chop the, the beam into little packets of, in time. Uh, they'll cut the beam. You've got something like a velocity selector. It's a big wheel with a channel through it. And as the channel spins, the neutron's got to have just the right speed to make it through. And the third one, I've spoken a little bit about spallation sources and pulsed sources. If you've generated your neutron at a specific time when the pulse hits the target and your instrument's a certain distance away, you can use the, the time from when you created the neutron to when you eventually detect it to work out what its wavelength was. Right, so in a little bit more detail, I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the crystal monochromators first. Uh, this is a picture of sort of a typical monochromator that we might use. Uh, this is on an instrument that really needs a lot of neutrons. It's a, a, a three-axis spectrometer. So you can see the sort of size of these materials here. They're you know, tens of centimeters large, some of them. Um, common materials that we use would be things like graphite. That's very, very nice. Uh, it, uh, it's relatively cheap. You can get it. It's got a very well-defined despacing, uh, and you can get it in, in quantity. Another thing that's very important, though, is it has sort of an intrinsic mosaic spread, so it's not perfect. And this is very important for neutrons. If you get a crystal that's too perfect, then you constrain Bragg's law too much. You can only see uh, either a very, very small delta lambda coming out, or you've got a very, very small delta theta that you can use. And that really limits the number of neutrons that you'll eventually get out of your beam. So because we have so few of them to begin with, we have to relax some of the resolution to get enough flux. And one of the ways we do that is to have non-perfect crystals with a mosaic spread that's a little bit larger. And graphite comes with an intrinsic mosaic spread. The best graphite you can buy commercially has about this mosaic spread. So it has a high reflectivity, very nice crystal properties. We use that a lot. Silicon, we, we can use. That's very nice. It, it's perfect. Right? So it's not good in that sense, but what you do is you, you literally bend it. You put it in a device that will physically bend it, and then you can get some sort of focusing effect from it as well. It also has an advantage because of the crystal structure that the, there is no 222 reflection out of, uh, out of silicon. So when you look at Bragg's law, M, M of 1 will reflect, M of 2 does not. And that's a property of the crystal, uh, the, the, the crystal structure factor. Germanium sometimes used. It has similar properties to, to silicon, but it also comes with its own mosaic spread. So that's nice. Copper is used. If you want to uh, look at the higher energy neutrons, then you've got to reduce the despacing, and copper is quite nice for that. This Heusler one's an interesting one as well. Uh, that's an alloy of copper, uh, manganese, and aluminium. Uh, it has about the same despacing as graphite, but it's really interesting because it's magnetic. And it only reflects one spin state for the neutron. So the neutrons come in and they have a spin, right? So the spin will be randomly oriented. The Heuslers only reflect one of those spin states because of, uh, because of the magnetic properties of the crystal. So we'll use that to polarize the beam, to produce one spin state of the beam coming out. And if you're interested in resolution, you can sort of partly get this you know, idea of your delta lambda if you differentiate Bragg's law coming out of that. Now you'll notice as well that the crystals here, it's not one crystal. Uh, oh, there are different faces on this as well. That's a graphite monochromator there. That's a copper monochromator there. 
Uh, and you'll notice that it's not just one crystal, but it's lots and lots of them. And they're on some rather complicated mechanics here. Uh, you can play with the orientation of these crystals, uh, and you can't operate them as a mirror, uh, but you can use some sort of focusing. If you tilt them in a certain way, then Bragg's law is, is true for the certain relative orientation of the neutrons to the beam. So you can get sort of a focusing. If you tilt your crystals in a certain way, you can make something like a, a circular or, or a parabolic or, or a, a cylindrical uh, reflecting monochromator to focus your beam. And people uh, exploit that. Here's a, a picture where people have done that uh, on an instrument, again at the ILL, called the uh, Thales. Uh, your neutrons are coming from the guide. Uh, the guide here has been designed specially to sort of bring the beam and try and focus it to a point in here. And then the monochromator, all the individual crystals are, are tilted slightly so that the Bragg condition is satisfied correctly for each position as you go across the monochromator. And these neutrons are then reflected to the sample position. So you can apply this sort of a focusing condition to try and get the maximum number of usable neutron or useful neutrons onto your sample. Uh, here's a couple of examples of uh, instruments at ILL that exploit that. It tends to be used more at um, reactors because reactors are producing continuous neutrons. So you've got all the wavelengths coming out of your beam at once and you only want one. So how do you get them out? Uh, crystal, diff uh, crystal monochromators are a good way of doing it. So these two are diffractometers. Here's a powder diffractometer here. Neutrons come out, uh, you have a powder sample in the middle and a big bank of detectors to measure those, those neutrons that come out. Uh, this is a single crystal instrument here. Uh, similar sort of thing though, monochromator. And here your sample would sit on a, an Euler cradle so you could rotate it uh, and then you detect it afterwards. You can also think about putting monochromators before and after the sample. All right? So in these cases, you know what your incident wavelength is, but you don't know what your final wavelength is. Your wavelength gives you the energy. So if you want to measure an energy change inside your sample, you need to know the wavelength after the sample as well. All right? So you can use a monochromator to do that as well. Uh, we call it an analyzer, though, because it's analyzing the final energy. Uh, and this is a, a type of instrument called a, a three-axis spectrometer. Uh, here you've got some neutrons come in, they hit your monochromator, and you know, what the, uh, you know what the incident wavelength is, and therefore the incident energy, because you can rotate this crystal and you can rotate the entire instrument around that axis. So that's one axis that you can rotate around. Uh, then you've got a second axis here after the sample. You've got another crystal afterwards that selects only one energy from scattered from the sample. And this energy doesn't have to be that energy. They can be different. So what you're doing is you're coming in with one Ki, if you like. You're, coming, you're only measuring one Kf. So you're measuring a specific Q and a specific energy transfer inside your sample. And again, you can rotate this around that axis. That's your second axis. And the third axis, of course, it matters how these vectors align with respect to your sample. So you can rotate your sample around the third axis, hence it's called a three axis. But that's an example where you would use monochromators to choose your incident and your final uh, wavelength. Uh, the second way that people use to determine the wavelength is called time of flight. Right? And it's more or less what it says on the tin. If you took a beam and you somehow managed to chop it up into a little packet in time, but that neutron beam has all the energies, it has all the wavelengths, what will happen right, is that as you go out in space, then these neutrons will spread out in time. Right? The highest energy neutrons arrive first, the slowest energy neutrons arrive last. And what you do is you measure the amount of time it takes for them to cover a certain distance, and that tells you the, uh, the energy. Okay? So this gives you some ideas here of the sorts of speeds of the neutrons for the different uh, for the different wavelengths. I've chosen two here. Two angstrom neutrons, which is uh, about 2,000 meters a second. 20 angstrom neutrons, which are about 200 meters a second. Uh, so you, you just chuck some numbers into that. Uh, let's make the instrument about seven meters long. That's fairly typical for uh, one of these types of instruments, you know, a, a few meters, whatever it is. Uh, the fastest neutrons here will arrive at uh, 3.5 milliseconds. The slowest neutrons arrive 10 times greater than that, 35 milliseconds. You obviously need a, a detector that's prompt. So the idea is as soon as the neutron is detected, or absorbed, I should say, by the nucleus, it decays immediately, or as close as, as you can get, to give this charged particle, which the, you then detect. So it's got to be a good prompt detector. But if you do that, uh, and this gives you the sort of curve, this is a sort of uh, intensity spectrum that you might see from a typical instrument. This one is called D17. Uh, 
And this shows you the normalized intensity here is a function of the time of flight. This instrument is about seven meters long. Those, uh, those numbers correspond. And then on one axis here, you've got the time of flight. On the other axis, you can see the wavelength. Uh, you could alternatively plot the energy up here if you wanted, because wavelength and energy, you can use one to calculate the other. Now, that's, if you, uh, that's from a reactor source. It's a continuous source. Uh, but many spallation sources are pulsed. As I mentioned earlier, they'll produce a neutron pulse when the protons hit the target. Um, and that means that if you make your instrument a certain size, you're automatically adapted for these type of time of flight measurements. So these pulse sources make a huge uh, use of the time of flight method. Uh, in fact, if you go to ISIS, all of the instruments operate on time of flight. Uh, the ESS is a little bit different. Some of the instruments, they'll all operate on some form of time of flight, but uh, it's a little bit more of a specialized source. But in essence, these spallation sources, these pulse spallation sources, they're automatically adapted for, um, for the time of flight measurements. The final resolution you get then uh, is not really given by, uh, on, on the measurement. If you want to know what your delta lambda is, it's given by the time width. So your beam will arrive at a certain time. It's how quickly you can, you can measure. Uh, it's also dictated by uh, how finely you can chop the beam and things like that. It's a time width you're worried about. Uh, the time width is, in this case, you have the initial pulse. Uh, now, the pulse isn't a delta function in time. It has a certain delta t. And you're producing all the, uh, the neutrons of all the wavelengths inside that delta t. And then you go out to a certain distance, and then these, these things all spread out. But what will happen is you, you will get some overlap as, in time as you go out. So you'll end up with a, a delta lambda associated by the width of the initial pulse, and it also matters how long you make the instrument. You also have to worry about the moderator. Obviously, the neutrons that come out, as I mentioned earlier, they've got very high energy. You need to slow them down. Okay, so you slow them down. Uh, that means they're rattling around inside the monitor. That makes your time pulse a little bit longer. And the resolution that you eventually get depends on what type of moderator you use. So what's very important with these types of instruments is uh, that you need to design your instrument from the source to the detector. If you've got a similar instrument at a continuous source, you don't worry so much about this. You have to somehow mechanically chop the beam later. But here, these time of flight instruments, the way they design them, it's really coupled from when you produce the neutrons right through to when you detect them. Uh, that's, that's absolutely key. You can't just, at the ILL, one day if you decided, all right, we don't like this instrument anymore, we're going to take it out, put another one on. It's a bit like Lego. You could actually do it. You could take one out and put the other one in and, and so it would go. You can't do that at a time of flight source. It really has to be optimized from the source to the detector. Uh, so here's, uh, here's a couple of, of sources. I've shown you the ISIS one earlier. Uh, this is the ESS that's coming online. This is the, their, their initial suite of instruments. And I mentioned earlier that some of these guides are 150 meters long, 160 meters long. The reason for that is because they're trying to exploit this time of flight method uh, to be able to get the resolution they want. And they need to make the instrument 150 meters long to be able to get the time resolution to be able to tell what their wavelength is when eventually they get into their detectors. Yep? No, the time of flight, if you do a reflection, your path length has changed by some infinitesimally small amount because the angles are so small that the actual distance, if you consider the number of reflections that you, you have over 150 meters, you might have a number of reflections, but it's made effectively no, dis no difference to the distance that the neutrons have traveled. Now, that's what they're doing at the moment, but if you go back and you look at what the ESS was originally proposing, some of these instruments here, they were proposing 300 meters long to make these guides. And again, the reason for doing that is coupled to the time resolution that they eventually need when they eventually get to their, uh, to, to their detector to be able to work out what the wavelength was. Now, I don't know what the state of the art is with this at the moment. Um, they're obviously not building it in the first wave. They have provision for uh, other instruments in the future. So maybe in 10, 20 years' time, they'll be looking to build other instruments. Maybe they'll be building these. I don't actually know what the state of the art is. That will be extremely expensive, though, to build a 300-meter long instrument. Okay, so what if the pulse is too long? All right, so a reactor, you have no uh, time structure to the neutrons produced by a reactor. They're produced in the fission process, they come out, uh, but you might want to build a time of flight instrument on a reactor source. Alternatively, you'll have these continuous spallation sources like at, uh, at the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland. The ESS has got a rather unusual uh, time structure. It's what's called a long pulse. So, at ISIS, you have a very short, sharp pulse of, of protons, produces neutrons in a very short, sharp time pulse. 
at the ESS, they want to have a much longer time pulse and they want to be able to exploit that. But that means that they can't always use that time structure of their pulse to be able to get good resolution. So what happens if you've got this problem? You have to mechanically chop your beam and you use these devices that we imaginatively call choppers. All right, so simple ones might be just discs with holes in them. And you spin the disc. Uh, the neutron, when it hits the, uh, the side of the disc, gets absorbed. And when it hits a hole, it goes straight through. You can't hit a hole. You can go through a hole. So it, it, it goes straight through. This is a disc chopper. You get a second one here called a Fermi chopper. I think Enrico Fermi was the first one to propose this. Uh, it's, a, it's a similar sort of concept, but it's a cylinder. And inside the cylinder, you put a collimator. You spin it. Uh, there are different types of things like this. Uh, the, the collimator gives you a little bit better definition on the time when you do it. You can get, uh, you get the same effect if you have multiple ones of these or a single one of these. Uh, it depends on how you want to design your instrument. And these are used a lot, not just at reactor sources, but also uh, at uh, short, sharp pulse spallation sources. You can get rid of harmonics and things like this. This is a, an instrument at, at ISIS. It's a diffractometer called WISH. Uh, at ISIS, they produce this short, sharp pulse in time, and they use then the time from the source to the detector to work out the wavelength. But they still have these disks to be able to somehow shape the, uh, uh, the time structure and to be able to get rid of um, something called frame overlap, which I'll come to in a minute, where you can get overlapping. Uh, you, you'll get neutrons of multiple wavelengths that will arrive at the same time in your detector, and you can't differentiate. You can use these... Uh, disks here, and they've got to be at strategic distances to be able to get just the neutrons you want through at just the right time. Uh, you can also use these choppers to monochromate. Okay? So if you've got a continuous source to begin with, and you put in one of these choppers, and you, you chop your beam up in little packets in time, and you let them run for a certain distance, by the time you get to some later point along your instrument, you've got a spread in these, uh, in these wavelengths in time. So what you do is you put a second chopper here, and you phase it in time with the first one. And then you're only chopping out the wavelengths that you want. So here you'll get a monochromatic pulsed beam. Right? So that's, that can be very useful. Uh, you can build an instrument which is called uh, a direct geometry spectrometer in that case. So now you know what the wavelength of the incident beam is. Right? Because you've set it up. This initial chopping, for example, this could be done by the source. So at ISIS, you would combine the pulse from your source with some choppers downstream. At ILL, you would need multiple choppers because you'd start with the continuous beam and you put in multiple choppers. Eventually, you get a nice monochromatic pulsed beam. You know what the incident wavelength is because you've chopped it. And then you measure the time of flight from the sample to the detector. That tells you what your final wavelength is. So you know your initial energy, you know your final energy. You're able to use this as a spectrometer to work out your energy change. And you'll sometimes see pictures that look like this that sort of show how, uh, how, how these things are supposed to work. You've got distance here, right? Starting from your source, you've got a chopper, sample, detector, and you've got time. And obviously, th this thing is periodic, right? So you, you're chopping, you've got some sort of frequency associated with that. Uh, if, you, if you plot the, uh, these gradients here, are supposed to be the, uh, represent the speeds of the neutrons for the different wavelengths. Right? So neutrons that are coming out with a higher energy, they've got a steeper gradient. Right? Neutrons with a lower energy come out with a lower gradient. Now you get a whole spread of wavelengths coming off your original, uh, original source, and then you phase the chopper in such a way that only the neutrons of the wavelength you want go through. Then they hit your sample. Then your sample either gives or receives energy, and you'll get a spread then of energy that eventually goes into your detector. There's your elastic scattered neutrons. Uh, and then you'll have some that have neutron energy gain and some that have neutron energy loss. And again, you've got to be very careful about how you design this because if you're not, you will find the fastest neutrons from the next pulse will overlap with the slowest neutrons from the previous pulse. That gives you something called frame overlap. You have no way of knowing, if you measure a neutron at this time here, you have no way of knowing its wavelength or its energy uh, except for the time of flight. So if you don't design your instrument carefully, then, and these two overlap, then you've, you've got a region of, of, of space here, a region of, of energies that you, you just can't work it out. So you've got to be very careful in designing these instruments that you minimize this frame overlap. And for that reason, again, if you've got one of these pulsed sources, this is one of the reasons why these distances here are, are so long for some of the instruments, is to be able to avoid this sort of frame overlap problem when you eventually get into the detector. Now, there's obviously a lot of instruments associated with that here at ILL. Uh, we've got an instrument called IN5. Yep, 
Yes, in fact, there are multiple instruments that can do that. This is called rep rate multiplication. Uh, and it's, it's effectively a, a much more complicated version whoop, of this. All right, so instead of having one wavelength come out, you'll have multiple wavelengths. But if you look at what arrives in the detector after all these chopper systems, one time period corresponds to one wavelength. Uh, and then you somehow fill in these little gaps here with other wavelengths. So this is, called, this is a much more complicated version of this picture. And there's a number of instruments around the world that use that now. So that's called rep rate multiplication. Uh, right, so here uh, you've got uh, a couple of instruments, one at ILL, which uses a bunch of these choppers to a direct geometry instrument. Eventually you get a monochromatic pulsed beam, time of flight to get into the detectors. This is one called Merlin at ISIS, same sort of thing. Here you've got uh, a chopper just in front of the sample and you're using the time structure of the source as your initial point, uh, same sort of principle. You can also combine the two methods for monochromating, a uh, time of flight method and a, uh, a monochromator. So this is now old. This instrument no longer exists at the ILL. It's been superseded. But I don't have a picture of the new one. The new one's called Panther. This is a picture of IN4. Uh, but it does show the, uh, the principle. So the neutrons come out from here. You've got a monochromator to choose your incident wavelength. Uh, you then have a chopper here. So your incident wavelength comes from the monochromator. And then you chop it mechanically using uh, this uh, Fermi chopper here, and then you measure the time of flight from the sample to the detector. This is again a direct geometry instrument. It's called direct geometry because you, you're, you're monochromating the, in, uh, the incident part of the beam. You can do it on the other side as well, a hybrid type of instrument with both monochromatic and time of flight functions. This would be an indirect uh, instrument where you monochromate after the sample. You'd have some sort of spread in wavelengths coming in, but you'd have a time structure associated with it. You get a whole bunch of uh, wavelengths that will come out from your sample, uh, but your analyzers here, which are also monochromators, they only choose one wavelength, and you measure when these arrive relative to when you started. You know what your final energy is based on the analyzers. You work out your initial energies based on the time of flight from when this arrived relative to your, your incident pulse. And that's the way you would work out what your incident wavelength was. Uh, here's a couple of examples. This is often used at spallation sources in uh, using a technique called backscattering. Uh, so here you've got one called OSIRIS. The neutrons come in from here. If you look carefully, you've got a graphite analyzer bank behind. Uh, and that's what selects the final energy. You've got a similar one here. It's a, an option on an instrument called IN16B called BATS. Same sort of principle. Uh, you have a pulse uh, part at the front. And then you've got these crystals in a huge bank that will reflect the neutrons back through Bragg reflection. That tells you what your final energy is. And with all of that, you cover, again, all the science. That's the way, that's the way you would build these instruments to, uh, to cover all of this. Um, I think I'm going to do this. I'm going to bore you. Uh, there was one other thing that I wanted to go through quickly, so bear with me, because um, I think it is very useful. It shows the way that you would do these experiments, or the way to think about doing these types of experiments if you had a monochromatic instrument or a time of flight instrument. And it's a bit different to what you would find if you do any other type of scattering experiment. So I think it's useful to show. I know it's half past 12, but I'll go through this as quickly as I can. Right, so the, the real issue, and this comes back to what I was saying yesterday, that you need to learn to work with vectors. Right, so with neutron scattering, it's, it's very important to think about vectors. It's very important to think about reciprocal space and how those vectors for your neutron beam correlate to what you're trying to look for in reciprocal space. So if you wanted to measure something uh, in a monochromatic scan, you have some sort of incident wave vector ki, well, initial k coming in. You would have some sort of final k coming out. And if you wanted to then do some sort of scan, you would have to move objects. You would have to somehow rotate your sample. You would have to move your detector. Every time you wanted to measure a different momentum transfer, you have to move things. That's not true in time of flight. In time of flight, what happens is that you can fix all your angles and nothing moves. But you might have a variation in the length of k, which is given by the different wavelengths that are coming along. So your incident beam here might have multiple wavelengths. And you're using the time of flight to work out which, uh, which time corresponds to which wavelength. And the same thing afterwards. You can use this time of flight going out. So in this particular instance, nothing is moving. Um, 
and you would be scanning a certain trajectory through reciprocal space without moving anything by using the, uh, the, the knowledge that you get through the time of flight of the wavelength. All right, now let's imagine that you wanted to do a, an experiment on, uh, you wanted to measure a Bragg peak, a, measure, a Bragg peak from a single crystal. All right, so this is a picture of what that might look like in reciprocal space. All right, you have reciprocal space, you have this point here, which is a reciprocal lattice position, that's where your Bragg peak is. And let's imagine that you wanted to do a scan along that direction. Right, you do a scan along that direction, it's going to tell you something about the, uh, the despacing of your crystal. Uh, so if you wanted to do that in a monochromatic scan, I'm going to call that a radial scan, right? because this here, that's my origin in reciprocal space, and that's a, a radial trajectory from the origin. If I wanted to do that on a monochromatic scan, my length of k, initial and final, stays the same. And I had to then rotate both my crystal, that's given by this angle here, and I've got to move my detector, which is that angle there, I've got to move them both. And then point by point, I would scan through that trajectory. In fact, that is something that is, some people might call a theta two theta scan. All right, you have to increase the angle of your sample by theta, you increase the angle of your detector by two theta. You want to do the same thing in a time of flight experiment, you don't have to move anything. All right, in this case, you set up the angle of your crystal and you set up the angle of your detector and then you use the time of flight to work out what your initial length of ki is and the time of flight to work out what your final length of ki is and if you assume all the scattering is elastic you're automatically covering this trajectory without having moved anything that can make this technique very powerful if for example your sample changes with time you want to know how this despacing might change uh, it takes you a certain amount of time to measure here you're measuring point by point so by the time you get from there to there your sample might have changed and you would never know but here, if you measure for five seconds, what you've got is the average structure of your sample over those five seconds. And then you could do something like uh, spectroscopic measurements where you, where you would bin in time and you could work out how your sample changed with time. So there's an advantage here. If you want to do a, a rocking curve, in this particular case with a, with a monochromatic scan, you would fix the angle to your detector and then you rotate the sample. That's called rocking the sample. And the trajectory you follow is this arc in reciprocal space. Right? Your Q goes from here to here. In time of flight, you also have to rock your sample. There's no avoiding it. In either case, you've got to rock your sample. But one thing that's kind of advantageous here is you're selecting always this uh, radial change as well. So you're, you're covering quite a lot of reciprocal space. So that's kind of nice because you can get like a, a reciprocal space map very, very quickly in a time of flight scan where you can't in a monochromatic scan. The flip side though is that these measurements tend to be uh, sort of inefficient. If you're only interested in a very small region of reciprocal space, you're collecting a lot of stuff that you're not, necess not necessarily interested in. In a monochromatic scan, you can focus all your intensity at that one position you're interested in. So in terms of speed, you cover a lot more of reciprocal space here, but if you look at the intensity in a particular position in, in Q, you're probably better off going this way. So in both situations, you'll get the same information. You need to think about which instrument and which technique you want to use to be able to work out the optimal way of doing the measurement. Right, so that covers then, that's the, uh, the region of reciprocal space that you would, you would cover. All right, now, let's talk a little bit about spectroscopy. That, was, that would be if you were doing a, uh, a diffraction experiment. Now, in terms of spectroscopy, I've showed you this already. This is a three-axis spectrometer. You've chosen an incident wavelength, you've chosen a final wavelength, and you've got the rotation of your sample to give you momentum transfer. So what you're doing with this instrument is you're measuring one position in Q, momentum transfer, and one uh, energy transfer, one point only. But you get a lot of intensity at that point. Now, I showed you yesterday a dispersion curve, for example, from a phonon. If you wanted to measure this, uh, particularly if it's from a single crystal, then you need to worry about the direction that the phonon is going in, in reciprocal space. Uh, you'll get some sort of energy transfer, or you, you've got some energy associated with the phonon, you've got some momentum here associated with the phonon. If you wanted to do a measurement, for example, along this direction, you would change the energy for a fixed Q, and you would go point by point, and you should get a nice peak where the, uh, the neutrons are interacting with the phonons. But that means you've got to do a rather complicated series of motions on your instrument. You need to change the angle of the crystal, 
You need to change the angle of the monochromator and possibly the analyzer. Uh, and you also need to change the angle between the incident and the final uh, uh, beams, effectively moving your detector around the sample. But if you do that, in this sort of situation here, you change all these uh, vectors correspondingly, Q is always fixed. Q is always the same. And what you're varying there is only the energy. So you've done an explicit energy scan at a fixed Q. If you do that, then you're able to cover something looking like this. This is a rather specific direction in reciprocal space. It's along the HHO direction in reciprocal space. And what they've done is sort of gone all the way up here and all the way along here. You're able to cover out all of this. But it's this one here, you would have to measure point by point. Uh, if you did it on, on a three axis. You could also do this in time of flight, but it becomes a bit more complicated. So here's the direct geometry uh, uh, spectrometer. You're coming in with a, a pulsed uh, beam in time, but it's also monochromatic. If you look at the trajectory you're covering there, then your, uh, your initial vector is, is fixed in length and in orientation. Your final vector is fixed in orientation, but the length changes. And the trajectory that you're following is, is uh, rather long in Q. You, you've got to go from a Q energy minimum to a Q energy maximum. Uh, but it also has a sort of an energy trajectory associated with it as well, right? Because the energy transfer here is different to the energy transfer here. And you've still only got one point there at the Q that you're interested in. In fact, this shows you the sort of trajectory that this follows uh, in that particular direction there. Uh, you can also sort of calculate it using sort of the, uh, the cosine rule there or, or this expression for the energy transfer. Uh, you do have to worry, though, about the, uh, the, the direction of the vector. Now, if you're doing this on a powdered sample, you don't really care about the direction of the vector. There's, you lose all directional information in a powder. It's all randomly oriented. So if you had some powdered sample, and you'll often see pictures that look like this, uh, you, you'll see your, your uh, Q omega map, if you like. It's magnitude of Q. And this is the energy transfer. It looks something like this. And your scattering will be somewhere in a shape that looks a bit like that. If you did it on a single crystal, though, you have to worry about the directional information in Q as well. Uh, so that there uh, is supposed to give you an idea of, of how you should think about doing these types of measurements. What is the most efficient way for you to do it if you wanted to do it in monochromatic mode or in time of flight mode, if you wanted to use a reactor source or a spallation source? And with that, it's now lunchtime. I'll just leave you with this, just to show you all the great stuff you can do. I would strongly encourage you to come and do some neutrons at some point, because they're great. And I'll thank you very much. You've been a marvelous audience.